first session, I think it was, uh, the speakers were excellent, and they covered quite a lot of ground, which probably would be uh, covered here. But anyway, let's get started. Um, uh, how, how do we start my uh, Okay, well, uh, right. Uh, so, am I supposed to talk only about coal? <laughs>
in China. But imagine that shale gas comes in. I mean, it will change dramatically uh, the, 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 the whole pattern because you can imagine a, a, a yellow slice in, uh, or, uh, in, in this graph and all of a sudden you have excess coal. So uh, maybe you have less imports of coal, for one thing. Um, and well, let's go to ore. You see that ore, uh, right now, uh, the ore prices have gone down. Uh, so has the steel price. Uh, and this is uh, because there is a slowdown in China, and therefore there's probably some uh, uh, excessive stocks, and the price has come down. And as you can see, there's a very good match between the, 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 the price of steel and, and the ore prices. So therefore, you can look at the price, uh, at the ore price as a good indicator. Um, now, plenty of stock in the system. There you have big in iron, uh, big iron ore inventories. Uh, look at this curve. I think you've seen it before. This is a marginal cost curve, and you can see that sort of as the price of of or uh, uh, increases uh, um, or decreases some of the, the, the mines in China are no longer uh, workable. So you would have expected, uh, a, a, that's just about the same curve, you would have expected all of a sudden a huge flow of, of, uh, of uh, iron ore from Australia and from Japan, uh, uh, from Australia and from Brazil, um, to have come and, uh, and the reverse of the of the freight rates, but this not not happened. So some really interesting thoughts, and I think you should look at this and and, and, and think about it. Uh, um, one of the brokers says, "Well, you know, uh, the, the reason why you have no more ore going is that uh, the the, uh, the mines are full capacity." Is that true? I don't know because I hear that. The mining uh, um, firms are uh, reducing their expansion, so who knows. The other thing is that, um, which is very interesting, is that, you know, whereas the, 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 uh, the price of ore went down to 86 in the summer, it quickly rebounded to 109. So in other words, it was very, a very temporary thing. So at 109, uh, again, the mines are probably uh, doing better in, in China. Uh, Australia is forecasting you know, better prices, uh, and, and so are others. And another very interesting thing is uh, that the, the mines in China, well, which should have stopped producing, have not stopped producing because they may have had a subsidy of $13 uh, a ton. Um, so, you know, as again, you know, you can make forecasts, you can uh, do things, but life works in a strange way. So I think these are interesting thoughts. Um, now, um, this is another um, uh, graph from Marsoft, and they say that the steel intensity is going to, to come down. Is that true? I'm not so sure. But uh, then you have the China, and the China plan is talking about 6% uh, expansion uh, uh, as against to 3 or 4% for Marsoft. So. Again, different different things. Um, now, what you have to look at really is at uh, uh, what's happening in urban infrastructure. And with the change in government in China, we may have a new uh, um, a new stimulus plan. So, uh, always look at that. That will tell you probably uh, how uh, the, the the shipments are going to move. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting is this graph from Barclays. I don't know whether it's correct or not, but uh, basically what it shows is that uh, the, the, the proportion of, um, of, uh, uh, of ore which is uh, contributing from China is decreasing. So um, I, I, I'm not sure. It could be that uh, it's due to very low ore prices or uh, a much lower quality of ore because, you know, as uh, you mine uh, and you get marginal uh, um, uh, uh, ore, and the, the content of iron goes down. Um, but one thing that is interesting is that China is always trying to diversify its import. This is a 2009 chart 
Uh, I haven't done one for, for this year, or it was not available, but you would see that uh, the, the India slice is a lot smaller. Uh, so things are changing, they are, they are investing in Africa, so look for more long holes. Uh, and that's my last word, light at the end of the tunnel. You see that really the, 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 the order uh, ratio is coming down and, you know, uh, it's going to take a, few, uh, a couple of years, but light is at the end of the tunnel. So let's try to be hopeful. Thank you very much. Okay, so now um, uh, we, we're going to get uh, um, a presentation by Lizarie New Young, who is a, a senior consultant with Drew in my time, and we look very much forward to see whether she's got a different view. Thank you. Please. So, um, but uh, however, it just shows you the steel production 
and the scale of the steel projects in China, being, most of them being planned along the East Coast. Uh, maybe now this is uh, much talked about slowdown is likely to bring some uh, scale back or delay, but this is overall the picture. So if you look at the chart on bottom right, 2016, we expect China's share of the global steel production to to reach 49, that is 49 percent, from 46 percent in 2011, to reach over one, one billion tons. Yeah, yeah, and India um, obviously is a growing market, um, and it continues to be a major force in the coal market, uh, both thermal and coking coal. Its electricity consumption has grown at a rapid pace, which has driven up the import demand for thermal coal. In this chart, it shows 2000 to 2011. During this period, the growth was about 25% per annum on average. Now, 2012, first half, I think the figure was around 66 million tons, which was an increase of about 5% over the same period last year. And the maps here show you the scale of this co-fired power plant development. Now, I read you some interesting, some latest Indian the industry report. So they were forecasting that over the next five years, um, around 30 gigawatts of coal-fired power generation capacity is likely to be added, of which coal imports of 230 million tons per annum is required. This would mean a nearly triple increase in coal imports from the level we see in 2011. And again, this shows the, in India the coal imports requirement as a result of the steel production. Um, and I won't, won't go into too much details about that. Um, so this slide, I try to summarize what a jury's view on the demand side. Basically, China is expected to continue to be the dominant driver despite the current slowdown scenario people are painting. Our view is that the country's dependence on iron ore imports will be long term. The rising electricity demand in developing Asia is expected to be another key driver stimulating growth in the, particularly in the thermal coal market. So in the forecast period, uh, we have up to 2016, we expect the demand for dry bulk vessels measured in tonne miles to grow faster than the trade demand, because they're likely to be more long-haul trade, as earlier mentioned. So for example, more trade, coal trade coming from South Africa to China, and we're likely also now we're seeing more coal trade from the US to China and or even to India. And also the discussion about the Australian mining tax. Uh, so we're likely to see the smaller mines being forced to, say, foreign countries to invest. That would also still stimulate the longer haul trade. So overall, the outlook for vessel demand in the long term remains positive. The question is that will this demand growth be enough to create a recovery? And one thing I should mention that. Uh, um, the, the current slowdown we discussed about, it is really, uh, for me, that's the major risk in the industry because it's less visible, unlike uh, the supply, which now I'm moving to. So this slide shows you dry bulk fleet delivery and demolition trend in recent years and the likely future development. But again, this is really based on order book rather than adjusted figures and also based on the expected delivery. And so despite this free trade weakness, we can see that uh, the delivery really increased in the last few years. Uh, in addition, but there also been lots of the slippage of new building deliveries because of the shipyard problem, ship owners, etc. So this has led to all these vessel deliveries being pushed backward, uh, which has, should have been delivered in earlier years. But later on, I'll show you how this is impacting our forecast for the free to supply. Um, but obviously, if all vessels are delivered on schedule, the dry bulk fleet will increase, as shown in this chart, by 31% over the next two years. But this is a very unlikely case 
because of the fleet operating inefficiencies and other factors now I'm going to cover um, this chart. Um, the first one, sh the top one shows you the dry bulk demolition for the past few years. In 2007, when the market was still strong, the older vessels were earning very high returns. So there was a negligible amount of demolition. But in 2011, this demolition increased significantly, particularly for the Cape size, and as earnings were below the break-even level. And earlier we were talking about uh, now even scrapping at the age of 15 years. So, but this reflects the annual one, so I don't have the 2012 figure. And basically, as a result of this oversupplied market, the demolition age has been falling in most of the dry bulk sectors. Um, and uh, the other interesting trend, as I mentioned here, is the new energy efficient designs. This is likely to squeeze some uh, the speed up the process of demolition because uh, of uh, yeah, this new investment and it's more pure, the economic uh, economically it's more efficient and also the environmental regulations on the on board ballast water treatment and emission control zone. Obviously, this will put more pressure on the industry. So, in future, we expect more scrapping taking place. Now, I want to touch on the shipbuilding capacity as it's one of the major issues. The boom years have prepared global shipbuilding capacity to expand from 50 million dead weight in 2002 to 200 million dead weight in 2010. China and a few other countries, even like Vietnam and the Philippines, have created new capacity to meet this demand and increase their market share. Much of the new shipbuilding capacity is focused on dry bulk vessels, we all knew that. So on average, nearly 30% of the total shipbuilding capacity is involved in the building of dry bulk ships. For the past three years, it has been over 60% of the total capacity. So there is clearly over capacity in this industry. Now yards are reducing prices to get new orders or resell these cancelled orders. So lots of orders are placed, it's not due to supply demand fundamentals, but rather due to the attraction of the price or what the ship owners believe or what the shipyards try to market. This is obviously like to every to the oversupply situation and free trade, trade market recovery. But uh, I believe there are some bright spots. Um, one of them is uh, the industry consolidation. Um, here I give you a few examples about countries in China, in South Korea, and in Japan. There are some industry uh, mergers, consolidations. It, especially in China, some small and medium-sized yards are facing great financial strain because getting funds from banks are more difficult. Many of the yards started to, ban to file for bankruptcy or debt restructuring. Um, and in Japan, we have this high-profile merger between IHI and Universal Shipbuilding. And if this trend of consolidation continues, we are likely to see much needed capacity reductions. Obviously, this will be good news for the freight market. Now, for dry bulk carriers, we started in 2011 with an order book schedule of 133 million dead weight for delivery within the year. The actual delivery was 89 million dead weight. This suggests a slippage of 33%. And the first eight months of 2008 saw only 41% of the scheduled order book being delivered we can see that the scheduled ship deliveries for 2012 is still quite high from the chart. Um, but given the current weak market, I would think that uh, actual deliveries would be obviously lower than what is suggested by the order book, perhaps in a similar level to 2011. Our annual forecasts are 416 million dead weight ship deliveries in 2012. And this is, will slow down to 83 million dead weight in 2013. And after 2013, deliveries will comprise of both slippage from previous years and presumably some continued new orders. But this also means yards will not work to their full capacity. 
And congestion is one issue I want to bring about. This has been a phenomenon for quite some time during the boom time. But despite the trade slowdown, actually, if you look at the chart, the con congestion level continues at a consistently high level. Um, port congestion effectively absorbs significant fleet surplus. <laughs> And this port congestion index shows the average waiting time at a port for loading and unloading. And uh, this lower chart shows you the congestion of the drive-out fleet at Australian, Brazilian, Indian, South Africa. I think all these combined. By the first week of September, congestion stood at 4% of the entire drive-out fleet. It's a still phenomenon. If you look at the demolition, which uh, somebody talked about around similar level, 4% of the entire fleet. Um, so there are currently there are a number of port infrastructure projects that are being developed in various regions. But this, whether this would reduce port congestion remains to be seen. If there are more trade, means more vessels, and uh, possibly it would mean more congestion when the infrastructure tries to catch up. So this chart, um, if you look at uh, the, the left one corresponding to the solid line, shows you the growth rate in demand and supply. And this dotted line shows you the difference between the supply and the demand from the peak in 2008, which should correspond to the right axis. Based on our current demand expectations, we see the supply surplus increase until 2014, when it peaks. The problem is that the surplus is being absorbed too slowly after 2014. And the to that is the demand uncertainty currently now facing China, facing Europe, and also to some extent elsewhere. Um, but there are yeah, as for well, some positive sign, I want to emphasize this here. Um, if you see the, the blue line, which shows this reduced speed, as you know, the slow steaming has been industry practice for quite a few years. So this also, in the way that it absorbs extra tonnage, because of the extra time required to finish one, one voyage, However, this, bear in mind, this reduced capacity can be easily brought back. And so now this is just a quick wrap up that um, we see on the demand side, dry bulk market has been stuck, struck by both the internal factors and external economic uncertainties. The larger order book means downturn may have yet to hit the bottom and the freight, rate, the freight market is likely to remain weak for some time. And rebalancing of the market will depend on both the reduced rate of new building deliveries through slippage and order cancellations, but also um, depend on the increased scrapping. And earlier we talked about these operational inefficiencies, so the, this congestion of slow steaming, etc. Um, obviously, if for any reason tonnage demand is stronger than expected, leading to higher freight rates, um, this will be, but, but this will be offset by lower scrapping and uh, higher fleet growth than expected. Therefore, any upside potential seems limited. So overall prospects are very uncertain, but one thing is certain is that without a healthy reduction in the fleet, we are unlikely to see any speedy recovery in this market. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Uh, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think your presentation had a lot of interesting graphs. There's one, one question I will have for you later on is, uh, you project one billion tons, uh, uh, you know, was it 2015 or maybe later, I can't remember what date you put, but that, uh, that puts the consumption at 800 kilos per, per inhabitant, which is uh, quite high, so anyway, thank you very much. Okay, the uh, next speaker doesn't need any introduction, is Jeremy Pan, who's the uh, Chairman of the board, or Chief Executive of the 
Baltic exchange, and I'm sure he's going to give us his own salt and pepper. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Philip. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be back here. Um, and uh, I hope there will be just as much controversy and lively debate as, uh, as I think there always is. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of main areas, really. Um, at, at the risk of sounding as though I'm talking about what we... That looks very dangerous up there. Um, at the risk of um, talking about what, what we do every day, I think it's perhaps worth uh, having a few minutes on the Baltic index production process, because almost every chart that we've seen today contains, very flatteringly, um, an example of the Baltic Dry Index, or the Baltic Cape Size Index, or the Full Time Charter Average, etc. And indices are actually very much um, in the firing line at the moment. They're a matter of some attention from um, European regulators, for example, the um, regulators in the UK as well, the financial markets regulators, etc. So I want to say a few words about those. And that also flows into the other topic that I want to talk about, which is the way in which um, index-based period business can be used to solve a number of issues which occur repeatedly in the market. And, and Mr. Grouse has mentioned the problem of, um, effectively, the problem of credit in time charter period business. So um, it's kind of relevant to um, uh, the, the earlier point about the indices themselves. So let's crack on. If we can let this work. Um, the EU at the moment has launched a uh, consultation on um, market benchmark construction. And this is obviously driven by the perception that um, a large number of banks around the world, once again, of course, it appears as though it's a, a London problem, but actually the LIBOR production process, in, in fact, is pretty much a global production process, albeit focused on London. So what's happened is there's a perception now that market benchmarks are often produced in a poor or corrupt way. Um, there's been a lot of flack over the years about the way in which certain benchmarks for the oil industry are produced and everybody sort of moans about those. Um, and, and the Baltic exchange indices are kind of caught up in that discussion. So I want to just talk briefly about why I think um, we are different, of course. Um, the, the key differentiate, the, the, the supposition coming from the European Union, particularly at the moment, is that if you want to have a market benchmark, it must be based on real, actual transactions. So, so to my mind, that's a very simplistic view. You know, market benchmarks should be based on real transactions. Now, in highly liquid markets like the interbank lending rate, that may well actually be practical. But the point about shipping is that it, that would be a completely impractical solution. There are not sufficient transactions on any given day, indeed in any given week necessarily, to be confident that you could report market benchmarks based on actual business done. Overall, the marketplace is illiquid and fragmented. It's also a relatively untransparent, a relatively opaque market. We don't spend a lot of time talking about our private affairs with each other. We do like to keep some of our business private. And the business which is made public is often um, business which we would like to make public. For, so, so our motives in making it public are not always perhaps the purest. So it's very difficult to imagine a situation where some, some um, demigod in Europe merely decides that we will all provide all of our transactional information to some central point, uh, presumably still the Baltic, and then we turn that around and, and create a, um, a sort of accurate and uncontroversial index. Because the other thing which is very important about shipping is there's no standardised transaction. This is not a question of how much a first quality bank needs to spend in order to borrow money from another first quality bank in the London market. Um, this is about the age of your ship, the performance of your ship, the size of your ship, the size of the stem for which it's being provided, etc. It's, it's an extremely um, variable marketplace. So the Baltic has an established way of approaching this. Um, we define a benchmark route, first of all. So we don't, uh, we don't say these are the only transactions we're considering. But we're saying all transactions 
within this vicinity are adjusted for the benchmark. And then most important of all, most important of all, we ask panelists who are independent commission earning brokers who do not have their own money in the marketplace to provide us with their view of rates. Okay. So we ask the panelists who actually negotiate the business, the brokers who negotiate the business, to give us their view of rates. They do not have a benefit for them from the market being up or the market being down, and that's critical, and it differentiates the Baltic indices, I think, from almost any other form of index production process. As well as, of course, the, the clarity of the definitions which we provide, and the process we go through in talking to brokers on a daily basis, making sure that they're considering all of the factors, making sure that they're adjusting for all of the factors. And I think the result is a system which has genuine independence and integrity, and which over the next uh, year or so, we may well be called upon to defend, and I hope I can enlist your support in doing so. Judging by the, the frequency with which the Baltic indices are, are quoted and cited, and often misrepresented, even within the industry, they're, they're well used and well respected, and I think if we want them to continue as they presently are, we may well need to be in a position to defend them. So, moving on, um, the question which was raised earlier by Mr. Gratzis was about, um, effectively, in summary, it was about credit risk. And this arises in a, a whole series of ways. When you put your ship out on period charter, whether or not that's a, a good business decision, as has been highlighted in the last couple of years, the critical factor is whether you get paid your, your freight routinely, and most importantly, whether the ship gets re-delivered to you um, in a much lower market than when you put it out. And that's happened on a number of occasions. Sometimes it's dis dishonest dealing. Sometimes it's bona fide renegotiation in changed circumstances where people are unable to generate the cash flow to sustain the business that they've, they've taken on. Sometimes it's bankruptcy and it's the administrator which is giving you the, the vessel back in effect. Um, the solution to this in many occasions, it's not the only solution, it's not the only approach to business, um, but it's one which is uh, increasingly in use, is um, using index-linked period time charters as a way of putting ships out at market rates. Obviously, the effect of that is twofold. One is, it does take that credit risk component out of the marketplace. It does mean that if your counterparty suffers from a declining market, you suffer with him. You can say, well, there's no hedge, I'll come on to that. Um, it also means if your counterparty goes bankrupt in the midst, if it's Eagle Bulk or, or whoever, and you get your ship re-delivered, at least you, get, you don't get it re-delivered from a, a $30,000 a day contract re-delivered in a $5,000 a day market. You get it back, there are costs associated with the relay, but you get it back at market rates when it was out at market rates. How, does, how do we solve the problem, though, of the, uh, the advantage of time charter period business, which is to fix the rate for the long term um, in, a, in a manner which you believe will be, will be profitable? And the answer there is you can use the FFA market. I know I'm not supposed to mention the FFA market in this forum, but nonetheless, you can. So, by putting your ship out on period at an index rate, which floats, may be adjusted for the quality of the ship, etc. Then using the FFA market, you are able actually to get a fixed return via the FFA. And in neither case do you have a significant credit risk, because by having a floating rate for your physical transaction, you, you um, take the credit risk out of it, as I've explained, and in the FFA market, now, uh, to all intents and purposes, all dry bulk FFAs are cleared, and that means that you are guaranteed to be paid what you're owed. So um, clearing takes the credit risk component out of the FFA market. Many people say to me, ah, well, the problem with that is it is costly. Um, you have to put up margin, there's a funding cost for the margin, etc. It is only the funding cost on the margin, it's the cash problem rather than an, a, a significant actual cost, but nonetheless it is there. But to that I would respond by saying that 
taking credit risk, as many people learned in 2008 and, and many have learned um, since, is always free. And there's always a cost associated with avoiding that credit risk. And, and those costs are involved in the, in the use of the derivatives market. I'll just make one final point, which was about the bank finance. I was at a conference recently um, where the question of cover taken for new buildings was much raised. And the idea that banks uh, encourage or force borrowers in the shape of the ship owner to put a ship out on period for, say, five years in order to generate some guaranteed cash flows during the early years of the loan. All sounds fantastic, until, of course, you do get an, e an Eagle Bark or a Sanko or a Torm, and ships get re-delivered early ahead of time. And then the bank cover appears to be absolutely worthless, or the, the, the uh, cover for the ship which the bank had demanded appears to be completely worthless. And again, I would encourage the financiers to think about these sorts of strategies which are able to um, get around some of those issues. Um, Duncan Dunn can't be with us. Duncan Dunn from Simpson Spencer Young is normally at this conference and uh, he unfortunately is, was taken ill over the weekend. He asked me if I would make an honourable mention of iron ore futures. I think um, iron ore uh, uh, derivatives are a growing market, growing in the way that the FFA market grew a few years ago. And um, he uh, would have stood up here and told you what a wonderful thing it is. So please uh, just uh, take that message from him if you would. Um, and I've done my duty by, uh, by uh, mentioning it. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. The only thing you didn't tell us is where the BDI uh, is going to be at the end of the year. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to find it on our website as usual. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you heard that uh, Duncan Dunn was taken ill and he hasn't been able to come. So, uh, we'll hear from Mr. Apostolo Sizakos, who's going to talk to us about uh, the future of bankers and uh, prices. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Change of subject. My uncle Francis. Uh, let's, try, let's try to see who, which are the main drivers for this process. The global demand of bankers is about 230 to 240 million tons per year, of which approximately 85% is fuel oil and the rest is gasoline. Generally speaking, long-term prices follow the fluctuations of the price of crude oil. In the short-term goal, sudden upsets of supply or demand may take place, either locally or in greater geographical region. Crude oil prices are set mainly at the NIMAX and ICE commodities exchanges and are as such are lit directly to the expectations of investors, which include petroleum companies, or traders, banks, and financial institutions. In the last two years, crude oil prices have been considered rather stable, moving within a range of 100 to 120 dollars per barrel for Brent crude oil. Consider that during this period there were supply disruptions in the North Sea, Yemen, Libya, Syria, and Iran, amid a weak global growth environment. Analyst consensus suggests that this environment persists over the next couple of years. As a general rule, high stocks for fuel oil prices do tend to reflect Singapore net back parity, given the fact that the Singapore high stocks for fuel oil market is supplied from US Gulf, Northwest Europe, Middle East. Etc., and that Singapore is the main banking hub globally with a demand exceeding 40 million tons per year. The crack, that is the difference between Brent and Hansel for fuel oil, 
various. Although changes in financial for pure oil price are correlated with the changes of crude oil, their intensity varies. Here is in the graph I have presented in the same units that is US dollars per metric ton for comparison reasons. Main contributing factors are the refinery economics or shutdowns in different parts of the world as well as change in demand. It's quite interesting to notice the evolution of price difference between low sulfur fuel oil and high sulfur fuel oil. For relative prices have been influenced by local events. Such events were the anticipated supply disruption during the Libya arrest in second quarter 2011, the oversupply of high sulfur fuel oil in second quarter 2012, and the late, lately the enforcement of North America ECA in August 1st, 2012. Uh, the same for use gone. Looking at the relative changes in the price of gas oil and fuel oils with respect to crude oil, it's obvious that the patterns are almost the same. The red line is the Brent, the green line is the gas oil, and the, the blue one is, is the low sulfur, and the, er, the black one is the gas oil fuel oil. Again, in the same units. The main price drivers beyond the crude oil price, similarly being the refinery economics, or shutdowns and the demand in a specific market. Here is the, the market of Northwest Europe, which considers, is considered to be the most competitive one. Most of you are familiar with the current and the forthcoming changes in the maximum super content allowances for marine fuels in ECIS and the rest of the world. Markets, historically speaking, adapt quickly to the new specifications, but not always with some issues. For example, the demand of low sulfur fuel oil in the recently established North America ECA is usually covered by blending of high sulfur fuel oil with gas oil or other cattle stocks. This results with very light fuel oil of low viscosity, which in some cases generates several issues on ignition combustion and performance of ship's main engines. Why this happens? This happens because the refiners in, in the United States and Mexico don't change their philosophy of operation because there is expected a new change in, in regulations in 2015. The most recent development in this front is the decision reached in the European Union bodies to enforce the 0.5% maximum sulfur content in all European Union territorial waters from January 1st, 2020, irrespective of the outcome of the relevant study reviewed by IMO regulations, which might move this global target to 2025. This development comes with the requirement of 0.1% maximum sulfur in 2000. In 15 is expected to drive a majority of ship owners to opt for the use of gas oil while selling NCAs instead of retrofitting scrappers or running for LNG. Based on the above assumptions, the main driver of marine fuel oil prices in the coming years remains the price of crude oil. Long-term estimations differ among the various analysts, but the fact is that in the first eight months of 2012, sports crude oil prices moved predominantly within the $100, $120 per barrel range. But future prices for December 2015 can kept converging to a price range of $90 to $95 per barrel. This is in line with marginal crude oil production costs and therefore could be adapted as a long-range planning assumption. This assumption supports movement to lower fuel oil and gas oil prices in absolute numbers, of course. For the next year, the expectation is that the price of Brent will line the range of 100 to 110 dollars per barrel. Due to the change of regulations in 2015, there will be a shift in demand from low sulfur fuel oil 
to gasoil of about 15 million tons per year. This fact would result in a temporary increase, would result in a temporary increase in the spread between gasoil and fractional fuel oil, which could even reach quite high levels in case that the oil futures market continues to be in backwardation as today. In the period running up to 2015, the spread between low sulfur fuel oil and high sulfur fuel oil is expected to remain high in the region of $50 per ton and then to decrease substantially due to the above change in regulations. So, that's all actually for me. Thanks to the Sunset, just from Asia. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rizakos. Now, before I open the floor for discussion, I would like to ask uh, if uh, Colin, who has disappeared, uh, so I can't really ask him, or Ralph, oh, Colin, but just in time. I was just saying that before I, uh, I give the floor to the speakers, uh, as um, Duncan Dunn has uh, been uh, taken ill, um, that maybe you and Ralph might have some comments on a topic where you could very well have spoken. So I don't know whether you want to start or not. No. No, no, I don't know fall and still supply and demand and its effect on my time transport, but this session really, I think Jeremy was just giving us a, a credit risk uh, solution, not a forecast, as he said. So you want me as a tank analyst to talk about the uh, iron ore and the coal now? Yes, exactly. Even right. though you've had a very good presentation from the lady over there. I had a very good, I, I just wanted... You want to hear it again? No, no, I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to know whether you had anything else to add, or if Ralph had anything else no, to add. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Good, good. Well, maybe you want to make a campaign against... Well, some questions, though, if that helps. <laughs> well, do you want questions, yeah? Uh, a, a question to, to you. Don't want to me if you like, yes. No, no, if you want to... I was thinking more of me giving a question to somebody else. So would you like to give a question to, to Liz Rain? Yes, I would, if I may. Thank you. <laughs> My question would be... Um, I thought it was a very good presentation, by the way, very thorough. Uh, the only bit that I, two areas that I, I was uh, thinking was missing maybe, was a risk assessment on the, the Indian situation. I think China is a centrally planned economy. I can feel confident that the power stations are going to be built. I don't have the same confidence in, in, in India. Um, the power infrastructure is not there. You see horrendous pictures of various wires coming off, you know, illegally coming off there and burning out regular basis. Um, you also hear that there's credit problems with the power stations, that they can't afford four cargoes, or they can't afford the Cape cargoes, and they split it into Panamaxes. It doesn't seem to me as if it's uh, something that's likely to go ahead the same pace as China. Um, so it would be interesting your comments on that. And the, the other thing is the, you mentioned slow steaming, you mentioned port congestion, but I think another factor which plays in favour of the supply or the absorption of it is not just the distance, it's how far you're going to ballast. I think there's more ballasting going on. I mean, we've got an iron ore carrier, it will be the big one, going from Brazil to whether it's Malaysia or it's going to China, hopefully it's going to China. It's got no capacity to carry anything on the way back. Whereas Capes, although less in recent times, have had the opportunity to pick up occasionally, you know, Australian cargoes going west. So I think there's a slightly new dynamic, and you did allude, of course, to the uh, South African situation, which is, again, I would suggest balancing again. So um, if you could comment on that, that would be useful. Thank you. Colin, thanks for your questions. Um, let me answer the first one about the India coal imports. Um, my personal view is that because if you look at the past few years, yes, you talk about the infrastructure, 
uh, problem and uh, including actually terminal capacity, etc. But uh, you, when you look at the actual volume, they are increasing. And I don't know how the country can afford to see a consistent uh, or frequent power cut or problem like that. And on top of that, this country has a large population base. Um, so and uh, it's it's growing at a much faster pace than in China. So obviously the demand will be there. And uh, um, I'm, uh, actually there are all, already some delays with the uh, various power um, project, etc. But uh, here, what I try to emphasize with, uh, is really ignore this uh, short-term bottleneck issue, etc. Um, uh, overall, the, the growth. Um, in, in the medium, obviously, the medium and long term, it's, uh, it's uh, strong and, uh, and it's well supported, and not just on volume terms, but also in terms of uh, distance, given that uh, uh, now, if you look at Indonesia, a lot of the exports of coal are ranged because the government is supporting, or the government realized domestically they need more coal themselves. So as a result, um, and uh, you see coal actually emerging, coal trade emerging from the, on the route from the U.S. to India. So that would obviously uh, stimulate more town mile demand in that sense. So I think uh, overall when we look at the shipping demand and uh, in terms of volume and distance, I still think India will still be uh, one of the key drivers. It's more so probably than in the past. Um, because of China, not, not because of the slowdown, but uh, given that it's a well-supported infrastructure development. So in terms of future growth, it's obviously it will slow down, and it's not just something people should be surprised to see as it is today. It's, for me, it's a natural cause, because uh, the, the, the penetration of steel consumption is relatively high compared, to, say, with Germany or the U.S., um, but if you look at India, the steel consumption is more around 60 uh, million tons per capita, uh, sorry, 60 uh, kilograms per, per capita, and compared with 460 for China. So there is significant scope for further penetration. So in every sense, I think India will grow faster um, on the, on the coal front, if I may say. And, and you talk about balancing. Yeah, I think that point, it's a very good point. It obviously will be a, a key factor and absorbing more tonnage, which hopefully is a cheerful factor for ship owners. Right, thank you very much. Uh, if I just may ask you, the question I asked you before, is that in your forecast you had one billion tons of steel production uh, I can't remember for which year, but that would mean 800 million tons, 800 kilograms per inhabitant, which is very, very high. Are you talking about China? China. Yes. Um, I, I don't think we have, let me refer to the figure. For the China's on or imports, etc., I have the historical figures. No, I was talking about steel production. Steel production, yeah. Okay, yes, 2016 figure to reach 1 billion tons, yeah. Uh, that, as I said, that was before this recent slowdown, revised the forecast was taken into account. So this was still based on, I believe it was April figures. So that time, the market still looks rosy, looked rosy. Um, but I still wouldn't think, I would think um, currently the, this slowdown is a temporary hiccup, in my view. That's why I emphasized in my presentation, I showed this monthly steel production and iron ore import figures because I want to emphasize, if you look at monthly, there are lots of fluctuations because the stock uh, level change. Um, plus, in China, you also see the domestic, uh, the production of uh, the iron ore quality is decreasing. Uh, that's the whole point why the, it relies so much on the import because the ore content in, in Chinese coal mine has deteriorated over the past many years from about 40 
to 100, from 40 to 20 now, in early 2000 to 20 now. So that's why there's a, a strong base, I think, to, to really protect a continued reliance or more reliance on imports. Yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you were saying. Uh, uh, I think I alluded uh, to it in, a, in, in my figures, and I also agree that uh, uh, this Chinese uh, slowdown is, is temporary because it's, uh, the, the price of oil is so linked to, uh, to, to the price of steel, and I don't think the price of steel uh, wages in China is sustainable. So uh, I think we'll. Uh, we'll We'll see, a, you know, a, a kick up, and this may work, very well happen with the, the the new government when it comes out, because we have to make a show, maybe. But I still believe that, however an optim, uh, opti, uh, unoptimistic you may be at this point of time, that your figure of one billion ton is very high. Yes, this could be yes on uh, an adjusted basis before this. Uh, at the most recent monthly readings. Um, but now the Chinese government, because of this further stimulus package they are talking about, which would uh, include significant investment in, in the public infrastructures on road, railway, and the marine ports. So I think that is one factor we take into account. Well, that was before this slowdown, but we took into account what was projecting these 2016 figures. Thank you very much. Now, Ralph, do you have something to add or some questions to ask? Oh, well, I think it's about what the, 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 you know, this topic. I mean, we have one person that was missing, so maybe you would have uh, put something else uh, that wasn't said here. Well, yes, I can put a few points. Uh, first thing, uh, Colin mentioned that uh, because China is a planned economy, so power plants in Apple will be built. On this specific topic, I would actually add that, that with the power plants in China, it's actually it's a bit of a mess. It's a messy situation because the, the, the power plants, it's actually very interesting here, that the, the, the power plants are actually run on a even though they are state-owned, uh, the purpose is to serve the economy as a whole. They actually run on, on a profit-making basis. And because they are squeezed between uh, having to pay for coal on a market basis and uh, facing caps set by the government uh, on, power, on, on electricity costs, which, which, which are actually capped uh, so to avoid running up inflation, so they have actually been uh, strong with coal price actually rather high in previous years. They have actually squeezed very much. Uh, and this causes them to avoid the postponed investment uh, to the point that uh, China, many regions in China are actually suffering from strong electricity uh, shortages because of that. Uh, so in some extent, the slowdown we have now in electricity generation it's probably even not so much due to lack of demand, but because of this kind of squeeze on expansion showing capacity which we had in previous years. Uh, uh, second point uh, uh, about India. One thing I'm actually wondering about, apart uh, the impact India has on, uh, on, on coal imports or coal trade, is that uh, we are seeing uh, exports of iron ore from India sharply actually reducing, sharply reducing. And even read some reports that there even instances of imports of iron ore to, Indi to Indian ports. I'm wondering, with uh, still, the steel consumption per capita in India is still very, very low, and so much to, to be done actually in terms of infrastructure investment in India over the next few, next few years. So, uh, I'm wondering how soon, uh, not if, but how soon uh, India will emerge as an actual importer, net importer of iron ore. And this will be an interesting development. Uh, a third thing, uh, maybe for, for, for you, 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 you,
one thing which I'm actually wondering about it, with all the talk about uh, slowdown in China, about uh, the problems for the steel industry there, uh, probably the, the main source of demand for steel in China is the real estate sector and construction. But right, right now I'm still seeing that uh, the government is not really doing anything actually to stimulate the real estate sector. If anything, uh, the policy seems still to be actually to try to do everything to prevent the price from going up, which means that restrictions on the real estate sector are still there, uh, like limits of buying two houses per families, uh, still very difficult to get mortgages, uh, and, and so on and so on, actually. Uh, it's still very difficult also for the developers to, to obtain finance from, from, from banks. Uh, do you think that uh, the circumstances will force the government actually to somehow scale down the restriction of real estate and try to stimulate the real sector with all the consequences? Uh, uh, maybe negative from a political point of view, maybe rising prices, but positive for the economy, for like positive demand. The Chinese government now is in the process of a transition, so you see the new leader coming on stage maybe anytime soon, within the next few weeks. So I would think if not for anything else, but just to, to, to boost the, the, this confidence of people, I, I would have I hold a more positive view about government effort in, in, in stimulating the construction sector in China. And on the other hand, earlier we were talking about softening commodity prices, but China is a very price-sensitive country, so if you look at iron ore in the past, typically when it softens, China tend to import more, it's almost on an immediate basis, so I would think now this softening market is... Yeah, could act on both ways. Uh, it is starting because of Chinese demand slow down, but in the meantime, because of the softening market, China might actually import more than you expected because of the lower prices. Uh, if I may also interject uh, and, and add something to what Lizrin has said. Uh, is that uh, I think that what you're going to see is maybe a restriction on the eastern belt, which is already well developed and uh, starts regulation, but they're going to push uh, in the western areas, which are uh, still very rural, so there's going to be a great deal of urbanization. I don't think that uh, urbanization is dead in China. I think it will go on for many years to go, but uh, it doesn't mean that the steel production is going to rise. Uh, for, for forever, and uh, you know, I mean, I have, I have a different opinion from this and I may be wrong, but I don't think we'll get to the billion tons so easily. Anyway, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely agree on this. In fact, right now, actually, we see so much development in the inland areas because we are essentially um, much the, the front end of the economy in China is moving from, from the coastal areas into the inland areas, also because all the manufacturing is moving there because it's being driven away by rising costs from coastal areas like, like Guangdong to, 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 to the inland. Uh, one, one thing which I think is important, which uh, Julian mentioned, it's, right now we are in the middle of the leadership transition in China. And this, in a way, is, is a bit of a problem because it means that uh, the leadership now is a bit busy with their own things uh, and uh, probably they're not really, really ready there to, to make any important moves. Or uh, to some extent, because uh, 
Because like, they, they did this the stimulus package actually they announced uh, last month. This has, this has been essentially bit more done, played up by the media because uh, it, it's not really that much. It, what, what, what it was was that uh, the National Development Control Commission just uh, put its stamp of approval on a number of projects like building subways in 20 cities, or any, which were things which were boiling over for, 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 for months. It's not really, really, really new stuff. Uh, it was more for the psychological effect of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Pavulis, you've been signaling, so I so yeah, yeah, haven't asked for the floor, but I'll give it to you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I will disagree in a way with uh, Mr. Pavulski, because uh, it was actually uh, a week ago or so when uh, the government announced uh, a big, I would say, huge. Uh, financial investment in the, on the west side of China, which actually counts $155 billion. Uh, and this, of course, uh, was done only for the reason which we all know very well. The major problem of China was the movement of the population towards the coastline. They wanted, wanted people back, but in order to go back, they need the infrastructure. And if they actually uh, count on that, then I will fully agree with uh, Ms. Yu Jiang that uh, they will need definitely more than one billion tons per annum. On the other hand, I have some more comments on the uh, Indian uh, coal imports. I believe that uh, Australia is in main. I mean, Australia and uh, <coughs> is the major just now provider, supplier of uh, the coal to India. And uh, up to now, they kept the volume that they had announced three years ago of a 15% per annum increase on the imports. Uh, this is something which was actually uh, announced, as I said, two, three years ago, and it was due for uh, a long term. Uh, inputs uh, for uh, another five, six years or so. Back to China. I believe that China will remain the motive power of the shipping. Uh, they do have the, the means of doing it. There are two things which I believe that will uh, definitely give something more than to it than we are having today. And uh, first of all is what I mentioned just before about this big investment. And the second one is what was announced uh, last week, at least on a private basis, that USA will uh, have uh, a very big, uh, huge, I say again, uh, investment of the banking system, about 40 billion per month for the next year which will give uh, another, let's say, another view of the American banks or the banks generally, because we all know that most of the banking system is based on the American movements. So uh, by giving this uh, investment, by giving this breath on the American uh, banking system, we will have much better results on the trade. Much better results in the trade is meaning also much better results in shipping. We hope in the better future. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Su, do you have anything to add to what has been said about China? Thank you, Jana. Normally, in my own whole conference in the morning session, we have the macro economy, and everyone is talking about China. Uh, I think, to be honest, personally, it's for the number four time from the beginning of 2009 here, I'm in the ION whole conference. I have never been so much lost myself about the picture of China. Uh, recently, of course, there are so many voices and all debates about the China economy situation now. Uh, because it's within China, in Hong Kong, in Asia especially, uh, 
about China situation. Uh, some comments are very serious, seeing Chinese economy is completely crashed, or at least hard landed. Hard landed. Uh, some people are thinking that uh, this, this uh, slowdown is just very temporary and uh, will be come back shortly after the transmission of new central government. Uh, I think, personally, this is just my personal feeling that um, I think this prediction uh, that done by uh, Lazare uh, from Drury is very much uh, uh, convincible from theory, from academic art, but from reality, uh, this is just my feeling as Chinese living outside China for over 10, 12 years now. I feel that uh, there are some serious problems happening there. Uh, and this serious problem, how deep the degree you go further, we have to wait until at least the middle of next year to see. Uh, because, of course, the transmission of the new central government will be completed by spring of next year. And, and what, whenever there will be new stimulus plan coming out, and then this new stimulus plan will really help the economy or not, is a question mark. Uh, well, on the other hand, I, I feel uh, the, the past stimulus plan that put out by Chinese government since 2009, which is about 600 billion US dollar, in reality so far this didn't help that much the economy recovery. Instead, it left a huge burden for the country's inflation problem. And this inflation has a very serious problem for everything in China and worldwide because this inflation makes Chinese competitiveness on the pricing and the cost is very much lower now. Uh, if you look at the economy uh, on which China is based on export oriented, China lost the battlefield to the small countries, I mean small countries from the side, not from uh, the position. Uh, like Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, they increasingly getting more Export cargoes like uh, the textile, the shoes, all these things are much bigger than China would have done in the last uh, 10 years because of the cost increase. And also, what we see in China now today, uh, in recent, uh, in the past several days, because it's Chinese festival period, in the coastal area, the, it's much the, uh, the advanced economy area of Chinese East Coast. We see a huge traffic jam in all the cities, all the highways. It means what? It means for the automobile industry, I think it's very difficult in a few years to put even another one million cars in the east coast. It is a huge threat for the steel industry. And the same for the real estate market, as it's hold cooled down by the Chinese government since especially 2000. 10 afterwards, the real estate market is facing a big challenge as well. So as for the stock market. So, uh, so in general, I feel, to be honest, it's very uncertain and relatively negative. Of course, we cannot admit that Chinese economy even slowed down with 6 to 7 percent even in uh, growth annually. It still represents a huge growth. Uh, but sometimes we have to look at even the I.O. imports, the figures, it doesn't mean anything in truth. Because the, the I, if we look at, in, a, in, in this year so far, the I.O. imported into China, or sold into China, the volume is increasing. But the increasing doesn't mean that the pizza in the bottom market was also growing up. No, in the country it was very much, very much weak and bearish. Because a lot of cargoes are moved not only by the Chinese and builders, they are moved by the, the I.O. and the coal suppliers on their CIF terms. Which means that we see a phenomena in Chinese ports that's a huge stockpile of I.O. cargoes without an end user taking them at any price. I think this is kind of um, situation also very tricky and we need to observe that. Uh, finally, my comments in general is that Xi Jinping, this is my personal feeling, is that always the boom of the shipping market always relies on a certain country, the booming economy. 
And this just like in 1960s, 70s, what the shipping market benefited from Japanese and Korean booming economy. And Chinese economy actually, if we look at the figure of GDP, the 10%, over 10% growth has been sustained since 1992, already 20 years from now. Uh, I think if the world rely on only one country for to to speculate on shipping investment things, I think that will be unwise and dangerous. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, almost presentation, I would say. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think Jeremy wants to, to interject something, I think. It was, it was just briefly to add one point to uh, the, the, the exposition that Mr. Su was making, which was, I was in China about um, 10 days ago and was um, re reminded that everything comes down to the fundamental contract between the Chinese government and the Chinese people, which is that you know, we'll see continuing economic growth and you'll allow us to continue running the country. And, and the figure that came out of various presentations there, which kind of um, distilled one issue for me, was the fact that um, employ factory employment is still very good. They're not suffering a wave of factory closures and uh, factory slowdowns and people being thrown out on the street, such as they did in 2008. And I think for that very reason, the Chinese government will not feel vulnerable to the point where they want necessarily to reverse their anti-inflation and anti-property boom policies. So, so the idea that post the um, new government coming in, in, I think it's the middle of November now, um, that we'll immediately see a large-scale stimulus for the Chinese economy, I think is, is undermined by the fact that actually the employment situation is really quite stable. Therefore, the government won't feel threatened and therefore pushed into action that they would, rather, that they would otherwise be rather reluctant to take. Thank you. Uh, David P. I understand you may want to say something.
probably guidelines would be a good thing to, to have, but as I said, I haven't really thought about that too much. I haven't thought about it at all, but uh, what I can say is that, uh, you know, in Venezuela, for instance, you have Ko Clerici, who, who has the, the, the reverse, in other words, they, they bring in the ships from inland, then they, 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 they load it into a, a huge mothership, and then the, then the mothership is discharged into loading ships. So, there is something happening already. Yeah, yeah and like I said, in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, the, uh, the, 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 the um, lots of uh, carriers are doing it. No, uh, ah, who Yes. Uh, I forgot who you are. <laughs> No, I, but I'm not speaking about the experience of Kreklerici. This was my, my, the period in which I was working in Kreklerici, so this project is a project that I have followed personally, not only in, in Venezuela, but also in the Gulf. Uh, in any case, light rail is becoming very, very uh, common in Indonesia. Uh, there are a lot of uh, units which are loading from barges to vessels. Uh, and we, as, uh, as uh, Rina, with uh, one of our engineering companies, which is Log Marine, we are starting a very, very delicate project in West Australia, in East Australia, sorry, in, uh, where there is the coral reef, uh, for loading 12 million tons of coal from barges to vessels. Uh, there is not a, a, a regulation, an international regulation, but for example, in this case, we are working on a project that is basically dust, completely dust free because the area is of course a sensitive area and they want to have. So we are working on a project that is uh, working under a vacuum, not vacuum, but under depression in order to avoid that there is uh, dust coming out. Uh, this is, um, uh, the question is interesting because of course uh, we are speaking of a kind of operation that is becoming more and more popular. Uh, I, I personally had the experience of working in Italy with this uh, kind of uh, operation in Piombino. Uh, again, an area which is very sensitive and in which there is a regulation. Even in uh, Venezuela uh, Lake, in, uh, in Maracaibo Lake, there is a, uh, but these are all local regulations. Of course, there is less sensitivity because if dry bulk goes into the sea, it's less dangerous or less, uh, let's say, less, uh, the, the, the action against the environment is less strong than uh, with, with oil or oil products, but uh, also this kind of uh, operation, I think, should have a, a regulation. I think it's a good idea. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me for not so much. Uh, uh, I look on the left, I don't look on the right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, I would like, before I ask, uh, give the word to, to George Patalaki. I would like to ask Mr. Gratos to make any comment on the presentation because he's one of our great shipping economists in Greece. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mbiekos. Uh, I think that Mr. Su's presentation with regard to the Chinese economy was uh, very uh, concise and clear and from what I, the only thing that I understand, I feel is that a lot of buildings and things like that have been built in China that are empty right now and many other investments that don't seem to be making money. So I imagine that is something that concerns the country very much. But otherwise, eventually, I think I don't see why China would not have a per capita steel consumption of the order of, let's say, the United States or Europe. I mean, it may take 10 or 15 years to get there, but they probably will. If, if we knew how many people are living on the sea coast, maybe if you divided the steel production by th that volume of people, you'd see that they're probably there already. No, uh, absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's already close to 800 on the, on the, on the sea coast. But uh, that's why my point uh, with uh, Liz Rain was that I don't expect 800 for the whole of China because once you go over the development, then you slow down, you see? And I don't think that the Western China would have that level of consumption. That was my point. Okay. Uh, you want to say something? Okay. Hugo, Hugo, uh, quick. Very short. 
I think the highest per capita consumption of steel is in Japan. Uh, and Korea. Japan is not a growing economy. Korea, Korea. Korea, oh, okay. Korea, but also I think that Japan is very close to that yeah. level. But, but Japan exports a lot. See. So you think this is coming from export and not for internal use? Yes. Okay. That's, what that, that's a point I made uh, last year and the year before. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think George Papadakis wants to say something. And please do. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> from Dynamarine for raising a very valid point. Uh, when my uh, committee member of the London p and uh, Club, I've been concerned for a long time of the implications for dry cargo for the unknown element of STS. And uh, I do personally believe that guidelines are needed just as with Kim made the STS requirements uh, for uh, lightning. I think that it's necessary for dry carbon because the amount of movements that I am, and the, if anybody here has any sources to give you which would help me understand or get a handle of the degree and the numbers of movements, it would be grateful. But I think that the movements of STS is much higher than uh, we think. There is no published material, so it's speculative. And one particular uh, movement I know in Canada uh, covers 10 million tons a year. Uh, and I'm taking that in isolation because I don't know the others. But I think that uh, definitely just as Serpent's Mouth started so many years ago, by you guys, I think that others are going to happen. Because let's face it, uh, the Chinese and other countries, not just China, were increasing their areas of uh, searching for alternative sources of coal are constrained by the U.S. low draft ports since the Americans haven't invested the 70 or 80 billion dollars that are guesstimated to be needed to increase their uh, ports. But I think that it's an area where the unknown grows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody that has more questions? Because it's about time we ate. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Please state your name. Stasis Kajeles, uh, journalist from uh, Shipping Net uh, Point uh, EU Worldwide uh, News Portal. Uh, a new law in Greece, Cyprus uh, also expected to, maybe Italy follows allows uh, the private companies to provide armed security services on ships sailing into high-risk currency uh, waters. Uh, how the shipping companies front this perspective? Are they interesting about these services? How they affect the operation, operational costs? Uh, this is a uh, question. Thank you. Anybody wants to answer this? Because that's a bit beyond the subject of this uh, of, of, of this session, really. Hello, hello Kim. Um, I think that's that's a session. It's not a question. Um, I'd be happy to deal with the gentleman and the students. I wouldn't want to keep everybody from their food. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Now we have one last question. Whether the gentleman can make Thank you. It's Nigel. My eyesight is failing. Sorry, Nigel. Maybe, maybe I just wanted to be given a microphone. Uh, now, now I have to think of a question. Um, oh, here's one. <laughs> uh, for Jeremy or for, or for anyone else who has a little bit of a picture of this, I, uh, I was very interested in your presentation. 
um, about index-linked uh, charter deals. Uh, and of course, I've got my general impression that these are rising. But I wonder if you have, uh, if you, or, or indeed anyone has, anything more of a, a picture on uh, the proportion of use of indexing contracts in the dry box sector. Um, uh, and, and there's a sub question whether the Greek dry box industry is particularly enamored, uh, rather more than anyone, uh, more than foreign counterparts in indexing chartering. Uh, and there's a third part to the question, what would happen if all dry bulk charters were index linked? What, what, would happen, what would happen to the market? Yeah. Um, I think really to get a clear picture of the, um, the, the transition that's taking place in the market, you need to get the brokers to make any comment. I don't know if there's, uh, I think there's a lady from Clarkson's here and there's Colin as well, um, who, would ha who would have a view, but certainly at the Baltic our impression is yes, there's considerably more being, business being fixed um, based on um, in indices and therefore floating rates. Certainly true of COAs, um, but also true increasingly of, of period uh, charters, so when ships are put out for a year or two years, it's very often at a, at a floating rate, so, so uh, definitely growing. Um, in terms of uh, the, the impact on the market, I think there'll, I hope there will always be, be um, specific um, spot business or, or uh, a specific trip business because without that we wouldn't be able to formulate the indices which are used for pricing the period business uh, on, on floating rates. So, so you know, you, you actually, we are nervous in um, thin markets, um, not true of the bulk trades and particularly not true of the cake market. But in thin markets where we see a lot of business being fixed um, based on indices, you do actually have to ask yourself where the spot business is going to be that enables you to, to develop the index. So um, it's kind of potentially an, index, uh, an issue in, in uh, smaller, smaller, thinner markets. Uh, but I'm sure Colin has other comment. I was just going to support you, Jeremy, for, for change. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is this whole I issue of um, indexing or this, you have to look at an institution like the Baltic Exchange because there are too many bodies out there including some you know, in your field which is in newspapers or media who think that they can put together indices uh, which are reflective of the market but they're actually manipulated by the end users. So I think the Baltic Exchange has a much better formula for dealing with it. Time charters on an index basis, well yeah. I think the issue is that indexes are on the spotlight, so there may be a regulation that says, well, why should you inflate it by cost? Um, because the market's the market, right? So it depends on how this, the thing works. I mean, years ago there was an element of, uh, sort of certain rates within the world scale structure, which you, they said were antitrust, and, and one has to be very careful of how you put these indices together. Um, there are deals which are index linked, um, but it's up to the individuals as to which, how, how, they, how they go by them. The shipyards can sometimes put index linked deals in there. If the steel price goes up by this, and, or I, I came across one once where they actually had a, a publication, they used Clarkson's Shipping Intelligence Weekly's uh, um, steel price indicator, uh, which of course is just gathered from other people's publications. Um, and then when they stopped publishing it, they, what they were going to do with the contract. So, you know, you do need to make sure that you've got something stable. But it's a whole area to explore. Um, you know, all me market mechanisms should be looked at. Um, I guess, you know, index linked will develop over time. Harry, uh, we, we haven't heard from you. You were first on the list. And I'm going to ask you a question. I made the point about shale gas. Uh, nobody has talked about it. I think it's a very important thing. It's a big uh, game changer. I'd be very interested from somebody who's a professional in that field, not in shale gas, but in gas transportation, to see your opinion, to hear your opinion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, we believe that generally uh, big quantities of uh, shale gas are probably negative for shipping. 
because if you think about that these developed economies um, are in great need of gas and now suddenly we are uh, uh, they're finding gas in their own uh, turf that means they need uh, uh, less ships um, the uh, United States was supposed to be a, a net importer of gas and a net importer of oil. Now suddenly they might be balanced or even become exporters of uh, oil and gas. Uh, this creates uh, uh, some disruption to the normal uh, gas lanes, for example, uh, Middle East to the States or uh, uh, Middle East to Japan or Russia to the States and so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's very positive for these countries themselves and uh, um, quite negative for the, for the shipping companies. George Gordon Mihalas, you want to say something? I, I wanted to respond to Nigel. If, if all charters were index related, then there would be no market that would be chasing our tail. Nobody would be able to differentiate themselves and have a commercial edge. But I think that what is important to note with, um, with uh, indexated charters is the fact that most of them have some type of bell and whistle attached, whether that's a floor, a profit sharing, a premium, or a discount to the index. If you put those bells and whistles on indexated charter, then it might have value and it might be interesting. If it's just a plain indexated charter, at least as far as I'm concerned, I don't see the point in it. Thanks. Right. Uh, anybody interested in indexing linked food? Because I think it's about time. Okay, anyway, thank you very much for a very good session. Ladies and gentlemen, one minute, let me have a